Yeah, yeah we live right now. Yeah. We're about to start a couple minutes. Yeah. Starting about two minutes. Two minutes. Looks like everybody's starting to come in. And so we're going to pray and we're going to start with the Lord's Prayer, followed by the Hebrew Credo. We can all remain seated and then we'll get right into the lesson. Precepts on real quick. Oh, and he's speaking. 
Speaking that voice like the most high. Like, uh. Jerry Evans. Her name is Jerry Evans. Okay, family, we about to get ready to bring in. You want me to hold baby? Or? No, Jay, Jay got it. You know, she wants to uh, grab his phone. Do you want me to go check it? Oh, it's the coffee later. Okay, here come the precepts right now. Okay, while that's coming through, everybody, may I ask that all brothers' heads are uncovered and all sisters' heads are covered as we open up in prayer. All hearts and minds clear. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Ahia, Asher, Ahia. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Baha Shem Yasha. Aman, Shemai, Yasha Allah, Ahaya, Allah Hayanawa, Ahaya, Akai, Shemai, Yasha Allah, Ahaya, Allah Hayanawa, Ahaya, Akai. Hear, O Israel, Ahaya, our God is one. Baha Shem Yasha, Aman. All right, all right, all right. I want to thank everyone for their um, diligence and their coming together as we commemorate the Feast of Purim, as we uh, end out the Holy Day, for it's pretty late in, late in the day. It's pretty much a new day now, so we're going to uh, honor the commandment and read out of the law and read the story of uh, Queen Esther, the story of Purim. <clears throat> So first off, we're going to uh, start with the uh, book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. But before we really get into it, I just kind of want to sum up the premise of the Holy Days so those that are new can get a thorough understanding on what we do here at Awakening of a High Select Church. And my apologies, I am Brother Baruch. For those that don't know, this is the Awakening of a High Select Church. Thank you for tuning into the lesson. So... The holy days of the scripture all are important and symbolic. They're different from the secular holidays that we used to celebrate in the world, which usually have deep ties in paganism and reverencing the creation. We reverence the creator, and the creator commanded these holy days. So all the holy days in the scripture tie into prophecy. And on a deeper level, salvation and the restoration of Israel is one of the biggest aspects of prophecy. So with that being said, today we're focusing on the Feast of Purim. And Purim is a holy day in which um, is a celebration of one particular instance that we were saved from being eradicated as a nation. And this ties into the first precept. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And it reads, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, the seed that the scripture is talking about ultimately 
is Christ, but it's Israel. And the woman that the scripture talks about, the following scripture, which is going to be in Revelation, is talking about the woman is Israel. This is the beginning of a conflict between the most highest chosen people, those that serve the most high, and those that serve Satan. Those that Satan is using to destroy the righteous out of the earth so that he can prove to the most high that his creation don't love him, that his creation don't listen to him. But all praise to the most high, he's always had a righteous remnant and those that will listen to the most high. So it started here. And now we're going to jump to the, the sum, the conclusion of this conflict. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Salaki, my apologies. It started there with man, with mankind. After the fall of Adam and things of that nature. Now this perpetual war will be taking place in the spiritual realm. Dealing with Satan versus the seed of the Most High. Ultimately Christ. <clears throat> Once again, that's Revelation chapter 12 verse 17. And it reads, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The woman being Israel and the remnant of her seed will be expounded right here. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yasha the Hamashiach or the Savior, the anointed. So in the end times, there will still be a remnant of people that are keeping the laws of the Most High. So it's crazy that someone could tell us and teach us that we don't have to follow God's laws. And it teaches us that in the end days, Satan will be worn with these people as it was in the beginning and as it was throughout all history. So with that being said, we're going to deal with Purim. But just as an overview, dealing with the holy days that deal with salvation, there was always a vessel, a human, a person being used by Satan to do the will of Satan, to destroy Israel to destroy God's people. Back in the days of Moses, you had Pharaoh. Back in the days of Christ, you had King Herod, and, and so on and so forth. There are many examples. In one nation of people in particular that you see all throughout Scripture and even through modern day that Satan has been using is Esau or the Tabernacles of Edom. And we're going to really dive into that because it's important to know that when dealing with the Feast of Purim, because the head, the spearhead of Satan's attack on Israel at this time was an Edomite. And this isn't the first occurrence in the scripture. So we're going to dive into that. So the next precept we're going to go to is the book of Esther, chapter three, verse one. And we're going to start here just so we can really lay the framework and really see, we really understand the fullness of why the Most High's commandment is so important. When he tells us to do something, he means do it. And this vessel that Satan was using is here because of the disobedience of one of our other kings or forefathers. So we're going to get into it. Once again, that's Esther chapter 3 verse 1. And it reads, after these things, the king Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Now, he was an Agagite, and that's important because we're about to get into the scriptures to show that Agag was a descendant of Amalek, and Amalek was the grandson of Edom, of Esau. So we're gonna we're gonna go to another precept and get more um, understanding on that on that pretense, and it just shows that Satan has been using these people, and this is just one instance where he's used the Edomites, but it just shows that this main antagonist come from a line of people that Satan has been using, and 
his ultimate goal was to destroy Israel through the will of Satan. And that has been the Edom, a lot of the Edomites driving force, the tabernacles of Edom, that's been their driving force through, through the spirit of Satan. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 36, starting at verse 8. And this is just some of the genealogy on Esau, on Edom. Genesis chapter 36, verse 8. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. For those who don't know, Esau was the brother of Jacob. They were twin brothers. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau, Reuel, the son of Bashamoth, the wife of Esau, and the sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Zephor, Gatam, and Canaz. And Timnah was his concubine, was, was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. So the head of the Amalekites, or the father of the Amalekites, was Esau's grandson. Now we're going to jump down to verse 15. And it reads, These were the dupes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, Duke Taman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Canaz, Duke Korah, Duke Gatam, and Duke Amalek. Now, this is important because that word Duke is very important. And that word Duke, which in the concordance is H441, it means a chieftain or a captain, Duke or a chief, governor. So these were governors in the family of Esau, in the land that Esau dwelt. These were the leaders of that people. So these were the rulers of that people. And we're going to drop down to verse 31. And that just further shows you that they were rulers. And it also it states kings. They were kings and rulers in the family and in the land of Esau. So verse 31. And these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom. Before, the, before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. So this is their whole structure and hierarchy as far as rulership being established. And they come directly from Esau himself. These are his children. Okay? So now we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1 through 8. And this is going to give preference to what I stated earlier when I said when the Most High gives us a commandment, it's important. And throughout the scripture, you'll see... Like as in the times of Joshua and prior in the times of Moses, when the Most High sent us to reclaim our land that had been taken, he told us to destroy everything because everything that the Gentiles had was polluted. It was wicked. It was had to be purged. It had to, had to be clean. So we were to keep nothing. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, and it's going to also give preference to why the Most High had an all with the Edomites and with the Amalekites and how they treated us. And that is consistent throughout the scripture. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1 through 8. The book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Most High sent me to appoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Most High. Thus said Ahiah, Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now, I'm going to stop right there for a minute. 
This is one instance where the Amalekites afflicted the Israelites in a situation where they could have showed us mercy, but they didn't. And there are many examples and instances in the Bible where their true ruthlessness that was shown to their brethren was in excess. In the most high, this has the most high furious and has had the most high furious. But I say all that to say in the scripture, the most high says that there will be a remnant of all Gentiles, even Edom, that will be called by his name, that will be saved. But the tabernacles of Edom have been used since his conception to war against and oppress his brethren. Verse 3. This is a commandment to Saul. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them into lying, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is, over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. We're going to stop in, at that scripture, but if you read on, it'll show you that he transgressed the Most High, and the Most High stripped the kingship from him because he didn't utterly destroy the Amalekites. And we went to that scripture because that's going to tie into the main antagonist or the main... Um, the, the, the head of the opposition in the story of Queen Esther um, because he was a descendant from Agag, the king who uh, saw did not destroy it as the most I told him. So next precept, we're going to go ahead and go to the book of Esther and we're going to read it all the way through. And as we're reading, I'm just going to pretty much make references back to the scriptures we've referenced already and uh, let the spirit flow. So, next precept, Esther, chapter 1, verse 1. Now, just a preference, this is years and years and years after what we just read dealing with Saul, for those who don't know. So this is a few, probably a few, few, few generations later. Esther, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over in hundred and seventy and two twenty provinces. That in those days, when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even in hundred and fourscore days, or a hundred and eighty days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, green, and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble, the beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance, according to the state 
of the king, and the drinking was according to the law. None did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also, Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bista, Harbona, Bitha, and Abaktha, Zathar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in, his, in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And the, and the next unto him was Karshana, Shathar, Adamatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marsena, and Mecumen, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face, and was set the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. So lock it one moment. Verse 16, And Mimukin answered before the king and the princess, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king of Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. So this is going to cause all kind of uprising within the households of all the people of the provinces. So if they see this level of um, disrespect and not obeying of the king, they, 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 they're afraid of that. So they're going to plan to fix the perceived problem. So verse 18 Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have not heard of the deeds of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there grow a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the saying, and this saying pleased the king and the princess. And the king did according to the word of Memukin, for he sent letters into all the king's provinces and to every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Chapter 2. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done, and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan, the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hege, the king's chamberlain, keeper of women, and let their things for purification be given them, and let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti, and the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity 
which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried away. So this is after the Babylonian captivity. So you had uh, Babylon, the Medes and Persians, Greece, and Rome. So this is after the first major captivity. It says, verse 7, And he brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, who Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan, the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her things for purification, which such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Esther had not shown her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months, according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of her purification, accomplished to wit six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of women. Then thus came every maiden unto the king, whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women, to the custody of Sheashgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Now we're going to see later in the story how important this was this whole occurrence for our deliverance and our salvation at this time. So the Most High used our foremother, our sister Esther, as well as our forefather, our brother Mordecai, to um, relieve us of the perils that were to come. <clears throat> so we're going to get it. Verse 18. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, and he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not yet had not yet showed her kindred nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did not so Esther did the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth, or they were angry, and sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. And the thing, and the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto, queen, unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when the inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out, 
Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. So this gave good standing in the heart of the king to Mordecai and even more so unto Esther. So we're going to continue the story. Chapter 3. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the Agagite, and, the, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And we remember Agag, who was the king of Amalek, this is a descendant of him. So now he's in a high-ranking position under King Ahasuerus, who has a lot of dominion, who has a lot of provinces and a lot of land. So it's a pretty big deal. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king has so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matter was stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is, the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is, the lot, before Haman from day to day, and from month to month, to the twelfth month, that is, the month Adar. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. Now, I just want to uh, express here that this isn't the first time another nation has attempted to, through their rulership and through their government, afflict Israel and destroy us because of our laws. Not only that, there are many occurrences throughout our history where we were, our Bibles were burned, our scriptures, the Torah, our scrolls were burned, and if we were caught with them, we were killed. So, also, uh, the scripture says that in the Apocrypha, that the laws of our people are for the turn of those who oppress us and those who rule us and things of that nature. So, it's a very common theme that the rulers of this earth under the spirit of Satan, hate to see us function according to the Most High's will and under his law. And when we don't, he has control over us. But when we do serve our God, he protects us and they can't touch us. Verse, uh, we'll start off in verse 8 again. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among all the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. I just want to highlight the king giving his ring. That was the king signifying that he's giving all his power to Haman. And the scripture also calls Haman, the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. He's not to be trusted. He is seeking to devour and to destroy the Jews. And this is a common theme throughout all of those that Satan has used to attempt to eradicate Israel. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, to the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, 
and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writings thereof and to every people after their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people, that they should be ready against that day. The post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed. Chapter 4. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and cried a loud, with a loud and bitter cry. And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved. And she sent Raymond to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatach, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatach went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given as Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make requests before him for her people. And Hattach came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hattach and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of, of his to put him to death, except such whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live, but I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told and they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So, this was so her being in the position that she was in as a Jew was crucial and beneficial, and she had the duty and the 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 um. Not the responsibility. She had the she had the responsibility, but she had the position to subvert the destruction that was going to come upon her people. So that's kind of the dialogue that's going on. So uh, Mordecai is making sure they're on the same page and that she's going to stand up for her people. Uh, verse fifteen. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go. Gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, day or night. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, 
and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So she, they're as a nation, as a as a as a body, they're fasting for guidance. They're fasting for help from the Most High, and in faith that the Most High will prevail, the Most High will pull through, and that He will deliver them and do what they're um, inquiring. Verse seventeen. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Chapter 5. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner courts of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for them. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is... If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition that to, and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. Then went Haman forth that day, joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up, nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow I am invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then said Jeresh his wife and all his friends unto him, let a, gallow, let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high. And tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they be read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigtha, Bigtha and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the, on, king, on the king Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity had been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that minister unto him, There is nothing done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house, to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servants said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, and king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to honor more than myself? And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighted to honor, let the royal apparel be brought, 
which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste, and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighted to honor. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hast hasted to the house to his house mourning and having his head covered. He was full of shame when he saw what the king did for Mordecai, whom he hated. It, it brought a lot of shame on him. Mm -hmm. so. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, Thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. Hmm. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains, and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed thee, even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, and I, I and my people, to be destroyed to be slain and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then King Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen and the king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath went into the palace garden and Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine and Haman had fallen upon the bed whereupon Esther was then said the king Will he force the queen also before me in the house? And the word went out of the king's mouth. They covered Haman's face. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, which, spoke, which had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So, they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. So like I just want to add, it's funny because it, it reminds me of the commandment, well, of the scripture that um, with, ah, it's like it. I want to look it up real quick. I don't want to butcher the scripture, but the Most High was dealing with recompense. And he was saying with, with the measure that you have afflicted, you will be afflicted in so many words. Um, my apologies for any uh, lack any lack of force in that phrase, but that's the gist of the of the uh, scripture. And, and it just it just goes to show and uh, as a reminder, um, those that oppress the most highest people will be recompensed. You know, vengeance is the Lord's. So it just it just all ties in together. And that and that deals with salvation. And that's true salvation.
chapter 8. On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman the Jews' enemy unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther said, Mordecai, over the house of Haman. And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet, and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite, and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So she arose and stood before the king, and said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seen, and the thing seen right before the king, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman the son of Hamidatha the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews which are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name, and sealed with the king's ring, may no man reverse. Then were the king's scribes called at that time, in the third month, that is, the month Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof. And it was written, according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and, to, and the deputies and rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, in 127 provinces, unto every province, according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing, and according to their language. And he wrote in the king Ahasuerus' name, and sealed it with the king's ring, and sent letters by post on horseback, and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries, wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together, and stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and provinces, province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. So pretty much he reversed what was uh, written earlier by Haman and gave them charge. Defend yourselves. Anyone that tried to destroy y'all and you take their possessions. So this is almost like in after uh, during the time of the Exodus, how we had gained a lot of um we had gained a lot of things from the Egyptians and things of that nature. And in and, 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 and in many other places as well, but it's just another situation where just as Mordecai was exalted under the king, our people are um they're ascending up, they're 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 uh being held to a higher esteem if that if that comes across um clear. They're being they're being lifted up in a sense from the uh persecution that was that was uh sought to that they sought to do unto them. So verse twelve upon one day Salakia. Yo verse twelve upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, the copy of the writings for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people, and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So the posts that rode upon mules and camels went out, being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment, and the decree was given at Shushan the palace. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor, 
and in every province, and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast, and a good day, and many of the people of the land became of, of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now, that's not saying they became like the bloodline of Jews, that's saying that they began to follow the laws and uh, statutes and commandments that the Israel that the, that the people that the Israelites followed. So they be, they uh, changed gods. They began to serve our God. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary. That the Jews had ruled over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. And this reminds me of the final... The final... This reminds, this reminds me of the coming of Christ. When those that are dead in Christ will rise and those who, you know what I'm saying, those that are alive and righteous, that they will join the Most High's army and Christ's army and to fight and destroy all those who oppress and all things will be given back to Christ and Christ's kingdom will come. This reminds me a lot of that because in that time, in the end, nothing will be able to stand before Christ in the Most High. No enemy which there will be, as we read earlier, Satan um, will be wroth with that remnant and seek to make war, but they will not prevail. So this reminds me a lot of that. It's, it's, a, it's really it's a lot like a foreshadowing of what's to come, as a lot of our holy days are, as we stated earlier, how it deals with our salvation, the salvation of Israel. Verse 3. And the rulers, I mean, Salaf, yeah, verse 3. And all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and the officers of the king helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, waxed greater and greater. Thus, the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would do unto those that hated them. And in Shushan the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. And Parshadatha, and Dalphon, and Aspatha, and Poratha, and Adila, and Aridatha, and Par Parmashta, and Arasai, and Aridai, and Vajezatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they. But on their spoil, lay they not their hand. So like, and this just reminds me of the story that we read earlier in 1 Samuel. This isn't what Saul did. And it's funny because it's like if Saul would have did this, these people probably wouldn't even been here. So Satan probably would have used somebody else. But still, if Saul would have did what he was supposed to do and not laid his hand on the spoil and not kept him alive, we wouldn't even went through this exact, you know, this, this would have never happened. But it, it, it shows now they, they did it right. So, in uh, verse 10, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they, but on their spoil they laid not their hand. On that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan the palace was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed five hundred men in Shushan the palace, and the ten sons of Haman, which what, what have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. Or what is thy request further? And it shall be done. Then said, said Esther, If it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it so to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan. 
and they hanged Haman's ten sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together Shalakia, on the fourteenth day, also of the month of Dar, and slew three hundred men at Shushan, but on the prey they laid not their hand. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew, on the, and slew of their foes seventy and five thousand, but they laid their hands not on the prey. On the thirteenth day of the month Adar and on the fourteenth day of the same rested they and made it a great feast a, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled themselves on the thirteenth day thereof, and on the fourteenth day thereof, and on the fifteenth day of the same they rested, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the fourteenth day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting, and a good day, and of sending portions one to another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both near and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the fourteenth day of the month Adar and the fifteenth day of the same yearly. And the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day that they should make them days of feasting and, and joy and of sending of portions one to another and gifts to the poor. And the Jews undertook to do as they had begun and as Mordecai had written unto them, because Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them and had cast per, that is, the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, that, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Wherefore, they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur, which says Lot. Therefore, all the words of this letter and of that which they had seen concerning this matter and which they which had come unto them. The Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail, that they would keep these two days according to their writings and according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation every family, every province, every city, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. And that's why we reverence Purim and that we celebrate this holy day. Once again, it's reflecting on a time that the Most High saved us from complete and utter eradication and the gift giving and the giving to the poor and the feasting it's all um, a show of that gladness and that reverence and that thankfulness and that remembrance of this occurrence that we forget it not. As was stated earlier, because it's really a foreshadowing of what's to come at the end. As all of our holy days deal with prophecy and many with our salvation at a time and a foreshadowing of the ultimate um, restoration of Israel and salvation and uh, and uh, release from all our labors and our suffering. Verse 29. Then Esther the queen, the daughter of Abihel and Mordecai the, and Mordecai the Jew wrote with all authority to confirm this second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim in their times appointed according as Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had enjoined them and as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed 
the matters of the fastings and their cry. And the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book, chapter 10. And the king of Ahasuerus laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him, and they advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the king of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next unto Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace to all his seed. And that will conclude the reading of the story of Purim, uh, this lesson as an observance of the commandment of the holy day to uh, commemorate and to remember the things that took place. Um, and ultimately, is to keep us in the mindset that we have to be obedient unto the Most High, continue to grow in His law, continue to operate righteously before Him, that we are prepared for that great day when we will um, fully be redeemed for the final time, that we may be ready for that time. So um, that's just this, so that's the story of this holy day um, with the uh, as uh, as every holy day is reverencing. Um, salvation and reverence and prophecy. So with that, we'd like to conclude this lesson. I'm Brother Baruch of the Awakening Heisen Lake Church. Uh, thank you for your time and shalom.